jump into it, I want to just kind of high level cover what I'm talking about here. And so it's really that when we think about kind of primary banking functions with crypto in DeFi, users can lend to earn interest on the crypto that they're lending, or they can borrow crypto by providing capital, um, by providing collateral to be used against that loan. But so in a way, you can kind of be your own bank. What's interesting about this, and I think you know what's really compelling, um, it's early, but this is a system where when you remove that intermediary, you have much lower fees, right? There's less fric uh, friction, there's faster processing times, there's no credit checks or paperwork, and many people might say, well, that's really risky then. Um, who's the counterparty? What's their credit worthiness? And why would this system work? And it really then hinges on how loans are fully or over collateralized, and then how these are automatically liquidated given what's happening in the market as it pertains to that collateral. So well, this is this in really a nutshell well. what, what you're showing what you're showing here, and I don't want to break, keep bringing it back to the equity markets. I know we're talking about crypto, but isn't this in a nutshell what the banks didn't do? Like they over collateralized. Yeah, I think in some sense. Um, you know, I think what's probably I, I wouldn't necessarily say better, but what's different about this is the degree of transparency is much greater. You know exactly what's going on in the system. Um, you know, if you were to compare it to some of the banking crises that we've had, where I guess maybe 08 is, is a better example here, we know who owns what. Um, there's nothing that's off balance sheet. It can all be managed programmatically. Um, and so I think there's some you know, tie into kind of what we're seeing right now with a lot of these regional bank failures and just kind of a, I don't know if you want to call it a loss of confidence, but people moving their money around. And then obviously they're going to have to take losses in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think when you look at it kind of compared to 2008, there's definitely some efficiencies or some improvements when you have a system that's just more transparent in mm -hmm. that sense. And you know, when you look at the equity markets too, this is similar to how if you're with a brokerage account, a margin account, you might you know have some leverage. Uh, you have a position on it goes against you, and then that's managed. That same thing happens here, but it's in terms of you know the loans that you have outstanding. How are they over collateralized? You just have to put up more than um, than you're really going to be able to get through these protocols. So it's all programmed through the protocol that you're right. going to connect to, and so, we'll talk about that. So in what just is a the second. amount? What is the percentage? Yeah. So the majority of these are going to be. Um, 50% loan to value, right? So if I've got $10,000 of uh, collateral, I'm going to be able to borrow up to $5,000 against got that. Okay. Um, and it. then, you know, as it changes, so it protects I might you have up to, put to up more collateral. It protects you up to a basically a crash. Yes, yeah, it protects the, you know, the lender on the other side of that when you're borrowing um, through these systems. And got so it. if we jump to the next screen here, the next slide, take a look at of what this um, entails, comparing this to how we went through decentralized exchanges. But when you are your own bank, um, sorry, we do have it up on the screen. Um, we've got Trader Ryan, and he wants to BYOB, be your own bank. All you need to do is simply just connect your blockchain wallet, your crypto wallet, your Tasty Crypto app, which this ability is coming soon. Uh, we're working on it right now. Over the next couple of weeks, we should be able to release it. But you go to one of these protocols, just like you go to a decentralized exchange. So we have a couple up here. We have Aave, we've got Maker, DAO, and we've got Compound. And once you're connected, you simply just interact with the interface. You decide if I want to borrow, I can go that path. Or if I want to lend, I have uh, crypto in my wallet. Once I'm connected, I can decide to lend that out. And there are varying interest rates associated with both of those activities. And it's as simple as that. So there's no paperwork. Again, there's no one that says uh, at the bank, you know, you can get a loan, but you can't get a loan. Um, it's really easy if you need capital for one reason or another, or if you simply just need to, you know, move one token into something else and you want to speculate, you're able to do that through this system. Is the um, how how much do the rates fluctuate? It's a good question. You know, it's going to be in most cases, it's going to be based on supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So you will see, you know, some fluctu uh, fluctuations there. But I don't have any even time you know, of the day too, a little bit, right? Or is that not part of the equation? 
Yeah, you could certainly see that. It's not going to be something where, you know, you have a rate where I'm borrowing at 1% and all of a sudden it went to 5%, but you do see those fluctuations, um, you know, to some extent in the same way that you do in the traditional financial system. But um, I don't have any way to kind of quantify it mm -hmm. in terms of how much they've, they've changed, but I can look into that. Um, but what are the current rates? So if I can squint uh, at the screen here. Yeah, I can't um, see that. Yeah, so apologies. But if we look at, you know, assets that uh, you can borrow. Um, You've got 17% you and 8% and then 4%. I'm rounding. And then 4% yes. on Ethereum approximately? Ex exactly, yeah. So okay. if we just looked at Ethereum there, I've got about, yeah, 35 to 4%. Um, it was certainly... Yeah, there's you know going to be a, a higher rate at times associated with more volatility or, or simply just supply and demand on these protocols, um, but that's what you're looking at right now. So, you know, when you compare that to if I'm going to lend this out, um, you know, it's certainly not as high as what we're seeing. If I were to just go out and the yield I could could earn on uh, on Treasuries, but this will fluctuate at times as well, and it could be higher. And we, you know, certainly have seen an environment in uh, the traditional system where you've got much lower rates relative to where we are today. So that said, if we jump to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit more about you know how this this works, because again, a lot of people look at DeFi, think this is super risky, or just the idea that banking is you know <laughs> a pretty risky business. I think we're finding out. But these loans are fully collateralized by the assets that are deposited into a smart contract. And that's all facilitated by connecting your wallet, clicking a couple buttons on this interface, and now all of a sudden, you're either borrowing or lending in this system. It's really that simple. And as I mentioned before, platform's going to calculate the loan-to-value ratio. That's going to determine how much you can borrow. So using that simple example of, I have $10,000 worth of Ethereum that I'm going to post as collateral. In one system, I might have a 50% loan to value, so I'll be able to borrow up to $5,000. And then if the collateral value falls, the loan could hit a liquidation threshold, and that collateral is going to be liquidated um, to repay the loan. And that loan's outstanding until it's repaid by the borrower, um, including any fees or interest that might be associated with it via the protocol that you're using. So pretty straightforward in terms of how it works. If we jump to the next slide, just talk about a couple of the larger protocols that you could use to do this and just to put a little bit of context around it. I mean, these are still pretty small numbers, certainly when we compare it to yeah, those are, you know, just those the are size really, of these banks. Those are really small. But how many times has there been a liquidation? Oh, for individuals, that happens all the time, depending on not you know, individual. Hold on. Why would an individual get liquidated? Because this is all on an individual basis where if I put you know, my collateral into the system to borrow against, and yeah. then the price of Ethereum changes. No, no, of course, um, if the price of Ethereum yeah. changes, but the price of Ethereum would have to drop by 50%, you know? Yeah. Right. But Which, how often does that happen? I know it's happened in the past where the price of Ethereum has dropped significantly, but given the current levels that we're at and what Bitcoins and Ethereum have been doing over the last year, I mean, it hasn't happened in a long time. Yeah, it hasn't. So I suppose then it just depends on how long you have that loan outstanding um where you know you're going to be at obviously a higher risk of that happening but um, i don't have any numbers in front of me that said um you know i don't think it's something that happens all that frequently yeah but i don't, you I don't could, think it is you know, right. certainly see you know I, I think it's also it's a little bit different in this environment where we've seen that volatility come down relative to where the vol for ethereum or um, you know some of these other tokens especially that are much higher volatility where that has been over time, um, in certainly different periods in the market. Okay, and when but, it says when it says market cap on here, that's the market cap of the platform. That's right. So these MakerDAO, Aave, and Compound all have tokens that are associated with them. So I'm just using the market cap of the value of those tokens. Okay, that's um, and this is a okay. Fully, yeah, fully diluted market cap. Just to put a little context around it, I suppose, um, not necessarily one for one when we look at you know, the market cap of a company in the equity market, but 
similar, in, I suppose. Um, Ryan, Ryan, can so I you, ask before you continue on? Can I ask you a question from from a viewer, which I think is great? And, and again, I'm not. I, I don't know. I'm not the expert in the room on this subject at all. So I'm going to give it all to you. He, he, they ask, and this, I've got more than one of these. What's what makes this version any of DeFi safer than what was going on in in, in Voyager or anything else like that? Where you know, it, oh, that's com this is completely different. What's the difference? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to ask. So I don't know what that answer is. It's oh, a simple yeah, question. This is not, that's like comparing apples to oranges. Yeah, so the difference is, is that that wasn't DeFi. Everything that we've no. seen in the news is centralized entities that are going and doing things, unregulated activities that I suppose um, you know cause us a lot of problems in the banking system when those were done previously and then we got regulations. Um, you know, If we go back to kind of prop trading desks at financial institutions. Um, and that's the thing. And I've got a slide at the end actually talking about that. But yeah, you have uh, bankruptcies left and right. Celsius failed, Voyager, uh, Genesis, because they're taking capital, they're lending it out to various counterparties. And those counterparties are doing who knows what with it. And ultimately, we saw a lot of that blow up uh, stemming from the collapse of the Terra Luna ecosystem, three arrows, capital, and then all of these other dominoes fell because they were all connected. Nothing really to do with DeFi. Maybe those platforms leverage some of these protocols, but aside from that, not DeFi at all. And that's really the big and important difference here is that when you look at everything that's happened over the last year in crypto, all of the negative headlines, this has worked perfectly. Very good. Great. Excellent answer. So, Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah. So um, just a quick look at a couple of these here. You know, these are not the only ones. They all have different characteristics. But we look at TVL. That's the total value locked. Again, it's come down quite a bit given the market conditions um, that we've seen recently. But that's how much money has been deposited or locked up in the platform. When we look at the interest revenue that's been gener uh, generated here on an annualized basis, gives you an idea of what these protocols are making, not the protocols themselves, but the fees that are being generated for those um, that are lending capital here, and then the market cap. Um, and if we jump to the next slide, I just want to point out what I think are I have some interesting features here, and it's still really early, so who knows what people will come up with. But what's a little bit different about some of these protocols is just the flexibility that they have. Um, relative to how maybe rigid you know traditional banking might be. But you have things like flash loans. Uh, flash loan, and this might sound crazy to people, but is a loan where it can be borrowed, you can borrow without posting any collateral as long as the, um, the loan is repaid in the same transaction. So if you're able to identify an opportunity, and you know this is not something that you're gonna be able to easily do by just clicking a couple buttons, but if you can write code around this, or you can identify opportunities where there's inefficiencies, you know, some of these protocols will allow you to borrow. You can make this transaction and then just automatically or instantly repay what you've borrowed all in the same um, kind of period of time or all in the same during the same transaction. So there's some benefits to that from a trading perspective. I know it's a kind of a little bit fringe there in terms of how that works, but you also just have token rewards. So some of these protocols like Compound, if you just participate uh, right now, you receive rewards for participating. You receive the compound governance token. Participation awards. You said they wouldn't have any value. They do, <laughs> so I don't know if they do. Exactly. So that's one uh, one benefit or one feature, I suppose. You also have variable inter interest rates. Um, you have static or kind of stable interest rates with some of these as well. And it's still really early, so we'll see what you know they come up with. But those are a couple of the additional kind of unique features of these services. And then um, finally, you know, why if we jump to the next slide, why does this matter? Why should we care? Um, and this it pertains to DeFi beyond just being your own bank through borrowing and lending. But this creates a much more or enables a much more open financial system, it removes a lot of those existing barriers. Like I said, lower costs, increased efficiencies, great. But what it really opens the world up to is that you know I don't need to have a home where I can borrow against the equity in that home, or I have some other sort of kind of standardized collateral, or I have to go to a bank and I'm at the mercy of whether that banker is going to give me a loan or not. This is something where 
you know, it's trustless, which is actually a good thing. You can connect to these protocols. You don't have to be um, someone who has an existing relationship with a financial institution, and you're able to participate. Now, it's all really on chain, and it's using crypto as collateral. So it might not be exactly what you need this capital for, um, but I think that you'll see that evolve over time, um, and maybe that you'll see you know some of the existing financial institutions start to leverage some of this technology as well. And to the earlier question around what's different about any of this compared to what we've seen and what's blown up, is that DeFi's worked great. Um, what you've seen blow up is not DeFi. Celsius, BlockFi, Genesis. It wasn't DeFi. DeFi's worked really well. Um, it doesn't mean that it's riskless or that it can't collapse, but for the time that it's been around and the period that we've gone through, this has held up and it's been pretty stable. Hey, Ryan, a couple of things. Um, first of all, there's a lot less risk. I mean, let's let's face it, when, when anything's been cut in half price-wise, there's significantly less risk when when whatever you're collateralizing that loan with is against you know the underlying so if the if the basis is you know half of what it was before then there's theoretically less risk you know counterparty risk and um the other thing is that when you well, think there's, le there's, there's less to fall that there's less to just, fall that's right. all it is it's just less to fall and if you believe that there's some intrinsic value to sure. digital assets if you think there's no intrinsic value to digital assets then you would never do this um so what, what's really interesting is that when you think about, um, you know, people go, well, there's so much risk in, in the digital assets themselves. But what you never think about is how much risk was there in these regional banks that you never realized was risk. Um, and I'm talking about like over the 250,000, you know, whatever it is. Um, like you have no idea what kind of risk you're taking with inefficient, with incompetent um, management teams at regional banks or even top tier banks, as opposed to here, you completely control yourself. The hard part for me, exactly. the hard part for me is that before this becomes any kind of a valuable, um, uh, any, before this becomes a valuable tool for me, we have to complete the ability to transfer our digital assets from tasty trade into our tasty crypto wallet. Like until that exactly. happens, until that happens, there's no value from, you know, there's, I can't, I can't do this. So that, that's the next big step for you guys is to get that done. So that if we transfer assets and decide we want to do this, you know, that's, that's a simple way to do it. Yeah. And to that point, that's something that we've been working on for a little while here. Uh, we're very close in terms of releasing that feature where whether it's uh, borrowing and lending or it's the centralized exchange or some of the other activities that we're going to talk about in the future, yeah. you'll be able to use your Tasty Crypto wallet, connect it, and how, participate how in much, these protocols. How much retail, um, how much does retail participate in in this particular space and in, in those, in some of those numbers that you just showed, like how much of it's retail versus how much of it's like kind of professional? Oh, I think it's very little retail, um, and that is applicable to DeFi in general. Okay, sure. People just don't really know about it, you know? And when no. you look at the amount of wallet addresses that exist, even on the Ethereum blockchain, a lot of those wallet addresses have never even participated in a DeFi protocol, uh, yeah. regardless of whether it's you know institutional or what entity is, is behind that. Yeah. So super early still. Yeah, but once, yeah. I mean, it will be one of the first firms to have it. I mean, does you can do this on Coinbase currently, right? Yeah, you could do this with a, a few other self custody wallets that are out there, okay. as long as they have the ability to connect to um, the DeFi protocols. Yeah. So we're going to be launching that pretty soon, and I'll also mention that we've now made our mobile app available on iOS. You can download that today in the store, and we've just pushed the Android version out too. So they're both pretty much available at the same time. Android will be available. If it isn't already in the next hour or so as it processes right Yeah, now. I downloaded it last. I, uh, I loaded it up last night. It's beautiful. Good awesome. Job. Well, yep. it's nice to hear. So thanks. Yep. And yeah, we'll show everybody how to do some of these things and participate in these protocols on screen with the app in, uh, in short order. Thanks, beautiful. Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate your time. We'll oh. take a quick 90 second break. We'll come back. We got a market measure next on Zero Day Options. On Zero Day Options, listen Tasty Live.